welcome you to Palmerston Library Theater. And I'd like to thank the librarian here, Yana Georgieva Kaluba, and the branch manager, Misuk um, Hedman, for enabling the poetry and music salons to find a beautiful and hopefully permanent home. Um, and for promoting this event throughout the library system. So these salons are a gift to all of you in the thriving poetry and music community in Toronto. We're here to support each other in all, to be everything that we can each be. So welcome to our final poetry and music salon before summer break. It's going to be a superb evening. We have four features. In order of appearance will be Ariel Baklevi and Joe Ray, Brandon Pitts, and William Bouvet. Um, there'll probably be about four or so open mics. We'd like to start off with a fabulous open mic. She has been a feature at a Poetry and Music Salon uh, last summer, last year, spring, I guess, when we were at Urban Gallery, uh, Joni Page. I'm gonna do a song for you guys, and Brandon, uh, it's great to see you here tonight. I can't see you too well from up here, but uh, actually it's wonderful to see everybody. I have a lot of friends here from over the years that I really appreciate the writing and talent and so forth. <laughs> And this is a song called Shine, and it's just about shining.
Thank you very, very much. My name's Joni Page. I have some CDs for sale, if you like, and uh, stuff online. You guys know where to go. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you so much, Joni. That was wonderful. It's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to have you back. Um, our next open mic is going to be Stanley Pfefferman. And uh, he's an incredible person, but I'm not doing long introductions. No. <laughs> You'd never have enough time anyway. Hi, thank you. Uh, take a second to put the mic up. While I'm raising the mic, I just say something about the little clutch of poems that I've, I'll be reading in my three minutes or so. Um, I heard Brandon read the other day at the art bar. And then I realized, you know, that uh, for the Greeks, Eros was a deity. So erotic poetry, from a Greek point of view, is spiritual. And uh, Pan is a semi-deity. And that, so poems about nature are also spiritual. And then there are poems more closer to religion or religion practice. So I have a little clutch that kind of move through those areas in a very short time. <sighs> Trembling aspen hairs tail of squirrel move in you. A slight wind, red tulips touch and again touch. This world is big enough to be my lover. She forgets me. Tomorrow I'll see her everywhere playing with the distances. Thank you. Thank you. Then this one is more uh, spiritual. <laughs> it's called I Think of Her, more formally spiritual. Uh, fourth night of the waxing moon. I see it as my lady's neck ornament. The wind is weathered, tough and gnarled as a ponderosa root torn from rock. It smashes this meditation hut which shudders like a heart waiting and attentive. That, it is that my heart yearns for in the lull of the wind. One star, two owls hoot, a momentary breeze suffs through the bow of ponderosa and I think of her. Got to be going in. Open the cabin door, heat, and the smell of food, I think of her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Whew. Uh, this one is entitled Meditation, What's It Like? And it kind of moves from the ridiculous to the ridiculous, going through some other phases, not many. It's very short. Meditation. What's it like? It's like sitting on a blowtorch. In the rain and the rainbow, while air drinks her lovely juices and to yellow goes the green. It's like the Buddha sitting here watching his mind fill with scene after scene of all the stupid things you and your friends ever did or said. Thank you. Uh, oh, that's it. And then there's one more, which is the really spiritual one. Well, this one, this one is um, it's a devotional poem. It's called Meeting the Guru, and it's a full-fledged uh, devotional poem in a very weird light. Meeting the Guru. Some things never change, always change. Cricket song, for instance, who you are. Cricket song is who you are. Some kind of continuity in my life, a thread running like a stallion through the patchwork of perceptions as these eyes, ears, noses, tongues, bodies, minds unfold our world. Who you are never changes. Your neck is pine tree, 
Back and shoulders are cliff. Your eyes are crows. The kindness in them, lake, dark and inscrutable. You are the bright moon riding on water. You see everything simply. You are the nature of compassion. The doors of Terminal 1, Gate D, arrivals open and shut. They are a mouth, a mind, a womb, a vulva. Images pass from that world to this one. We are satisfied. We wait for you. Have eyes, ears, nose, etc. Only for you. You are in the hands of customs. You are giving them a thorough going over. I think of you that way and enjoy waiting. Like the sun from behind a passing cloud, you are there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stanley. And now we're going to have our first feature, Ariel Baklevi. Uh, he's he is an internationally known storyteller. He's appeared everywhere all over the world. He's done CDs. Uh, he's well-known and well-loved. Uh, welcome, Ariel. Thank you very much, Brenda, for that, uh, that lovely introduction. Um, far too complimentary than uh, I probably deserve, but uh, I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to share uh, some stories tonight. <clears throat> I mean, the stories that I'm going to tell are from the 13th century mystical poet Rumi. Some of you may have heard of uh, Rumi through the translations of Coleman Barks. For some of you, Rumi is a name you've heard for the first time. Uh, I could probably spend 20 minutes uh, introducing Rumi and his impact and the various um, open-ended aspects of his poetry and his stories. But tonight, I'd really like to uh, have these stories speak for themselves. So I will start with an invocation. I will tell two stories in succession, and then I will end the set with another closing um, verses. So it goes, these stories go something like this. Beshno azne chon hekayat mikonad Az jodaya shekayat mikonad Kaz ne estan chon marabo bride and Az nafiram Mart ozan nalide and. Listen to the song of the reed in its weeping, for it tells the story of our separation. For since the day the reed was torn from its riverbank, in its sorrow is heard the cry of every man of every woman. Once, once there was a Bedouin who lived in the desert. One day his wife approached him saying these words, husband, we are poor. We are so poor that during the day only the sunlight is our clothing, and at night only the moonlight are our bed covers. We are so poor that Maroch, the face of the moon, is our only cake, and the cool air of evening our only drink. Husband, we are poor, we must do something. But to these words, the Bedouin replied, My wife, you are too attached to the material things of this world. Look how God takes care of the creatures who fly across the skies. Look how good God takes care of the creatures that crawl the earth. Why will not God take care of us as well? You are too attached to the material things of this world. 
But to those words, his wife replied, Husband, husband, how you hide your pride behind a mask of virtue. It is not as you say, husband, understand, we are poor. We are so poor that when we pass our neighbors, they do not greet us for they no longer recognize us. We are so poor that now we are beginning not to recognize ourselves. Husband, we must do something. But to this he replied, My wife, my wife, once we were like a perfect pair of sandals. But now I see that one sandal is tighter than the other. Time to throw that sandal away. But when his wife heard these words, she gasped. Her eyes welled with tears. Husband, husband, what are you saying to me? How can you be so cruel? I'm only saying these things because I worry about you. I'm only saying these things because I am putting into words the very thing you are afraid to speak of. And is this the way you treat me? And so she began to weep. And when she wept, that mask of virtue fell from the face of the Bedouin. And he showed his wife his true face a face filled with worry and care. My wife, he said to her, I worry just as much as you. I worry so much that at night I pray that the sun will not rise the next day. I worry so much that when the sun rises every morning, I wonder I wonder how I will survive another day of poverty. But I don't know what to do. Husband, husband, there is something we can do. For have you not heard that in the great city of Baghdad, there is a khalife, a ruler who is as generous as Hatim al -Tay? This Khalife has given so much to so many. Surely if we ask him, he will give to us as well. My wife, what are you saying? You expect me to go to the great Khalife of Baghdad empty-handed? I don't have anything to give him. I would be covered in shame. You are wrong, husband. There is still something left that we can give. There are few drops of water left in our well. And so his wife went to the well and drew from that well the remaining drops of gray, brackish, foul-smelling water. And those drops of foul water she put in an old clay pitcher. She put a stopper on it and gave it to her husband and that would be his gift as he began his journey across the desert towards the great city of Baghdad. After some time, he arrived at the banks, the banks of the Arvan Rud, the banks of the river Tigris. And when he saw the sweet waters that flowed at his feet, his heart became so heavy, for this is what he said to himself. Look at these sweet waters in the river. What are these gray drops of brackish water in my pitcher? What are they, after all, but my own worries and my own cares? And look at this sweet water that flows right into the gardens of the palace of the great Khalifa himself. What will he want with this paltry gift I have in my hands? And yet, somehow, the Bedouin found the courage to follow the length of the Arvand Rud, the river Tigris, 
until he made his way to the great city of Baghdad. Somehow he found himself at the gates of the Khalifa's palace, and somehow he penetrated those gates, and there he was. There he was standing at the door, the door that led to the throne room of the Khalifa himself. The Khalifa was holding a divan and assembly that day, and he had invited all the ambassadors from Rum and China. And there, standing in front of the closed door, was a tall Turkish soldier. And despite all that he had gone through, all the long travels he had made, once he was at that door, he lost all courage lost all courage to present this gift that he was going to offer. He turned to the soldier and he said, Ah, oh sir, please, please, I do not have the courage. I do not have the courage to present the Khalifa with this gift I've brought to him from afar. Please, please, can you offer this gift to him on my behalf? And the tall Turkish soldier looked down on the Bedouin and said to him with a smile, Amja, uncle, don't you worry. I will present your gift to the Khalifa with my own hands. And so the soldier walked right into the throne room. And there, around the golden throne of the Khalifa, were all the dignitaries in their silken robes and the gold chains around their necks. And there was the Turkish soldier approaching the golden throne of the Khalifa. When he was at the side of the Khalifa, he whispered in the Khalifa's ear, explaining to him everything. And when the Khalifa heard all the story, he broke into a sad smile. At once he ordered servants to bring golden drinking cups before him. And when the golden drinking cups were before him, he removed the stopper from the pitcher and poured a few drops of that gray, brackish, foul-smelling water in each of those drinking cups. And then the drinking cups were passed around so that each dignitary there had in his hand a golden drinking cup filled with that gray, foul-smelling water. Then and then and only then did the Khalifa announce, did the Khalifa order that everyone there was to drink of what was put before them. The dignitaries began to whisper among themselves, has the Khalifa gone mad? Doesn't he see what's in these drinking cups? But the Khalifa looked into the eye of each and every one who was there, commanding them to do as he obeyed, or else. And so each put that cup slowly to their lips, and each drank of what was in their cup. But this water was so sweet. This water was sweet as honey, as sweet as wine spiced with cinnamon. This water was so sweet that to some it reminded them of someone who they loved who was no longer in this world. And they eyes welled with tears. To others, this water was so sweet that it reminded them of a childhood memory. And they began to laugh, laugh of a memory that had long escaped them. And then everyone began to be astonished. And they cried out all at once, Great Khalifa, Great Khalifa, explain to us why this water is so sweet. That is simple, said the Khalifa. That is simple. For you see, this water was a gift 
a gift that came from someone who thought he had nothing to offer. That is the secret of its sweetness. And so the empty pitcher was passed around, and each dignitary who was there dropped a ring, or an earring, or a necklace. Until when the pitcher returned to the hands of the Khalife, it was almost filled with jewels. The space that was left, the Khalife filled himself, so that there were jewels that spilled over the rim of the pitcher. And thus the pitcher was returned to the Bedouin. And when the Bedouin returned home, and his wife saw him carrying this pitcher that overflowed with jewels, she cried out, Husband, husband, what is this wonder that you bring back for me? And to this he replied, My wife, my love, this after all is your reward your reward for putting into words the very things I was afraid to speak of. And so from that day, prosperity came to the Bedouin and his wife, and it never left them until the end of their days. Once there was a sheikh, a sage, who gave everything away. He could not bear to have two coins rubbed together in the palm of his hand, that those coins felt to him like burning red coals. For every time he had a coin in his hand, or two coins, or three, he always had the same thought. Alas! Alas, there is someone who needs this money more than I. Alas, there is someone out there who needs this more than I. And so the sheikh gave and gave and gave and gave and gave some more until one day his disciple approached him and said to him, Ostad, teacher, you cannot go on like this. You keep giving and giving and leaving nothing for yourself. At least leave something for yourself. You can't keep giving and giving and giving. But when his disciple protested in that way, this was the sheikh's reply. Farzan, my child, understand this. All I own is only borrowed, but what I give belongs to me. All I own is only borrowed, but what I give belongs to me. And so the sheikh continued to give and give and give and give some more. He gave everything until he had nothing left. And then was the time that he had to borrow from another. But every time he borrowed from another, the same thing happened. He could not bear to have two coins rubbed together in the palm of his hand, for they felt like red-hot coals as he had this thought. Alas, there's someone who needs this money more than I. Alas, there is someone who needs this more than I. And so the sheikh continued to give and give and give and give some more. And when there was nothing left, he borrowed once again and gave and gave and gave again. And this happened for many years. And during those many years, the sheikh collected many creditors. Until the day came, 
the day which was his last day on this earth. He was lying on his deathbed. At his side was his disciple. His disciple, his eyes filled with tears, weeping, weeping for his master. And surrounding the bed of the sheikh were all the creditors, all the creditors that the sheikh had collected over the years. Their arms were folded, and they looked with stony looks as the sheikh, as he lay on his deathbed, and they muttered among themselves, Let's see now how he's going to pay his debts. Let's see now how the old man is going to pay his debts. And at that moment, the sheikh lost courage. All those stony glances, all those stony glares at him, coming at him all at once. He lost courage. And then, then he heard a cry from outside. Hava darim, hava yiye, hava darim, hava yiye. And when the sheikh heard that cry, the cry coming from the bright voice of a young boy, he began to smile. And he turned to his disciple, saying, Farzan, my child, don't you hear? Don't you hear that the halva seller is coming down our street? Bring him here at once. Bring him here at once, for you see I have no refreshments. No refreshments to give my guests who have gathered here today. And so the disciple left. And when he returned, he was followed by a boy. A boy who was balancing proudly a silver tray. A silver tray covered with pieces. Pieces of halva that was sweet. As sweet as first love. And the silver tray was passed around. And everyone who was there took their share. So that when the silver tray returned to the boy, he put it under his arm. And with his free arm, he stuck out his hand right in front of the sheikh. And he said, Aga, sir, that will be one gold dinar. And the sheikh looked at the boy with a sad smile, with a weary laugh. Pesaram, my child, if only, if only I had a gold dinar to give you. But I do not. Perhaps there is someone here, someone here in this room who can help me. But the creditors, with their arms folded, only looked away, muttering to themselves. And then the sheikh spoke again with the boy. Pesaram, my son, please forgive me for I do not have a gold dinar to give you. You must go home empty-handed after all. Now when the boy heard this, he threw that tray on the ground and it made a loud rattle and the boy began to cry, Old man, old man, you know what you've done? I'm going to go home tonight. And my master's going to beat me, beat me, beat me like he did last week. And I could walk for a week. Oh, man, you know what you've done. And the boy began to cry and cry and cry and cry. Until there was a knock at the door. And when the door opened, there at the doorstep was a merchant. He was holding a sack filled with golden coins and the merchant had on his face a quizzical smile. Bibakshid, excuse me, excuse me for interrupting your gathering here. But it was all so strange. For when I walked down this street and passed this very house, 
I heard the cry of a boy. And you know what? That cry of the boy reminded me of somebody. It reminded me of myself when I was a boy, when I was an orphan, when I had no family, and I wandered homeless down this very street. That time long ago, I remember knocking on this very door. And when the door opened, there was a man there who gave me a bed, who gave me a home, who gave me a family. So many years have passed since that time. And it was only today that I remember it. And so here I have come from the market with all my profits of the day. A paltry reward for the kindness that man had showed me many years ago. But here are all the riches I have on me and I offer them to you. And the sheikh, the sheikh looked to the merchant and he said to him, Aga, sir, go into that sack and take out one gold dinar and give it to the boy you see standing before you. And so when the boy had the golden dinar in his hand, he tossed it up and down as he wiped the tears off his face. And he left that home, beginning to sing a song. And then the sheikh turned to all the creditors who were there. My friends, he said, do you see what has happened today? Do you see what has happened today? Today I found my salvation in the cry of a boy. And now that I'm about to leave this world, I have but one last hope. And the hope is this, that each and every one of you here find your own salvation in the cry of a boy. Even if it's the cry of a boy that you have long forgotten. Even if it's the cry of a boy that comes from within you. And with those words, the sheikh breathed his last. And at that moment, in that terrible silence, that terrible silence just after death, those hearts of stone in the chest of each creditor began to melt, melt like wax in the sunshine. Their eyes, eyes that had been dried for years and years began to well up with tears. And they looked at all that wealth that was on the floor before them. Enough wealth to pay all their debts. And yet at that moment, all that wealth meant nothing. And the creditors looked at the wealth and they looked among themselves and each of them nodded in the same fashion for they all had the same idea. For with that wealth, they built a tomb, a tomb for the sheikh. And with the money that was left, they planted around that tomb a garden, a beautiful garden for children to play in, a garden whose gates were open every day to anyone who would come in and enjoy the garden. And it is told it is told that to this day that very garden exists and every day are to be seen children, children playing among the trees, children sitting at the steps of the tomb, eating halva, halva sweet as first love. 
بشنو از نیچون حکایت می کند. از جدایه شکایت می کند. Listen to the song of the reed in its weeping, for it tells the story of our separation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. Very moving, timeless stories about giving and sharing and capitalism and wealth and what real wealth is and what real poverty is. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we've got one more open mic before the break, a very special woman, uh, one of my favorite people, uh, a wonderful artist and poet, Jennifer Hosein. Thank you, Brenda. I'm going to keep it very short. Um, the a couple of pieces about my mother. Uh, she had a she had a surge heart surgery and then a stroke a few years ago. This piece is called Heart. All right. Is the mic okay? Okay. My mother's heart begins to drift away, but we are selfish and tell her to let her fi let them fix it, and we pace and pace the days. Don't tell her it's a poor sign, aortic valves open and close that keeps her herself until she is not herself. Voice crooked, face fallen, buttons askew, and pants half on the floor. I cannot begin. Beloved mother is a clipped winged bird that floats around in laced edge nightgowns, soft, soft skin like a schoolgirl's, shooing away the cats and always packing her clothes to go home. Um. Uh, the, next piece is, the next piece is called Winter. It's um, my mother passed away and my daughter left home and moved across the continent at the same time. So um, here it goes. I am, Dem I am Demeter in winter black as Hades, turning fields to stone, forests to dust in my wrath and despair that my beloved is gone. I pick rocks from the side of the road to eat in the absence of corn. They thunder along my intestines, dulling the noise in my head. I scream inside the walls of February, wait for my beloved who is light, breath, sun, spring. Make love to boys I have turned to stone in this Sorry, make love to boys I have turned to bones in this drought I have brought. I am Persephone, bound beneath the light, longing for the tick of my mother's heart, the pad of her yellowed feet on the floor. But my winter will linger for years, and my mother will tread across the skies, her feet into mountains, her face yellow as the sun, peering down at the shadow I have become. Demeter is my mother, Persephone, my daughter. I am neither, I am all, I am only winter. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I have one more piece. This is the first time I'm um, putting it out there. I was a little nervous to put it out there, but here goes. It's, his, it's called History. Look at me on his bed. History will not untie me. His story, always his story. Someone's his story. His cock dances around me, his cock like a beacon, a game of sticks. I tire of the ins and outs of, outs of me, my beauty laid flat on the bed for his story to unwind the night, the morning, the clothes from my back. I am just undressed, no lace, no red, no perfume, just my skin is me. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Okay, and there's a wonderful uh, crowd here tonight. I'm so happy to see you all. Uh, it's a beautiful space, and um, I'm going to be a permanent fixture at the library 
starting in September, the last Saturday afternoon of every month. It'll be 2 to 4 p.m., but because the library closes at 5, there'll be some leeway. We, we can have, you know, a little extra time. Uh, I like to do uh, five or six open mics and have a couple of features. And uh, I would really like to build a, a lovely community. Bring your friends out. It's large. We can seat 120 people here. And um, we also have the videos, which is nice and a good record. Uh, okay, so we're going to get started now. We have a wonderful uh, poet, Joe Ray, uh, very erudite, and um, I like his work very much. And he's kind of new on the scene, I would say. He's just starting to get his... His appetite whetted for doing readings. <laughs> so we're very fortunate to uh, have Joe Ray with us. Welcome, Joe. Well, thank you, Brenda, for your time and effort in having arranged this wonderful venue. And thank you for permitting me to share my work. The first poem are my thoughts on just being here, being alive. It's called uh, Music for Deckhands. I'm here between lines of myths and poems to plaster cracks with verse, quixotic, terse, tapping crude rhythms on a cracked kettle, gratefully bewildered, on the near side of rejoicing, I never did know why. I racked my brain. Yes, I had to try to feel at home to fly, to land upon my feet. It felt awry, as if I were quite unmoored. I'm sailing now, just another passenger on our unlikely home wobbling through heavy traffic, beaming messages at rocks. The next poem is about types of traffic. It's an incident that occurred on the New York Thruway. I heard the poor dog long before I saw him broken between the lanes, someone stopped. In next morning paper, I read, somebody down the road died. Poor dog howled a while. I drove on to start this poem in a roadhouse, mid TVs echoing their inanities from all corners of the globe. On a different frequency, I watched you floating through my histories, directing family traffic, counseling, consoling, cajoling, Now a change of mood into Dada. Dada was an art form created in Zurich in 1916 by a poet by the name of Tristan Sarda. It was a reaction to the Armenian genocide and the Battle of the Somme in uh, 1916. Dada is absurdity speaking to political madness. There are a couple of references in the indigenous language in this poem. Rapa Nui means uh, Easter Island. The Maui are uh, the stone statue heads. <clears throat> Sleeper sound soliloquy. Rapa Nui Moe still speak Dada. 
Dada's essence makes no sense response since in 16 cents the sum meant sum. Dada dredged delirium. Till resonance signals sympathetic semiotic as belligerence bombed to comma, Bosphorus genocide. Still Dada. Still shouts from lines of stone blind heads, staring to see from Rapa Nui's barren, see Dada in the headlines. Dada Moesi no see. The next one is much more angry. It's a reaction to politics. It's called Ostranini. Ostranini is a definition of art created by the Russian philosopher Viktor Shklovsky in reaction to the Bolshevik Revolution. Ostranini means the slowing down of observation until the object is stripped of its context. There are a couple of references in this poem. One is the Syrian refugee crisis. The other is the flyer. It's a roller coaster in Coney Island, stalled in the beach. It's a symbol of roller coasters stalled in beaches around the world. Ostranini, that Syrian toddler face down in Aegean shallows. Where were his water wings, his pail and shovel? Were his parents hooting and laughing on the flyer? Was his papa dozing in the sunshine? Now, horror at home. A combination of Dada and Dostranini. An honor killing. It's the dead eldest daughter speaking to her father. You probably remember this. A man aided by his son and his wife drowned his three daughters and their aunt in the Rideau Canal. Poems called Father's Day or It Really Killed Them in Kingston. You filled the roll, it's full the raw, full all of folly do all day. Not avoiding living folly is not seeing all the folly. It's avoiding. That's it, really. Dada knows that he knows best. Folly da. Folly Dada, dearest, fall into the grave with me. Not seeing as identity not seeing is identity. You know, the rest is paradox, you see. Don't do to doubt you, Dada. Don't do it, Dada. Don't you see, you know, you lose when you lose me. All the live long day, Dada, all the foggy, foggy way, Trilla. You lose. You lose. In every way, da da. Now your travail, trilla, trilla, this tale. Now da, a wailing we will go, hi ho! Ever wailing we will go. No more with Newton on the shore to dip a toe into the sea. Folly da, fall da da. It's all da-da all day. There's nothing da-da now in store but loss for you. 
Release for me. Fie, for you'd even fiddle my obituary. Da-da. Da-da's not dead in Kingston. You know, we have a house uh, in, a, in a forested acreage on the shore of Lake Ontario, and the changing seasons are <laughs> quite obvious, and, 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 and we watch the impact on the fauna. This poem is called Swan Song. Swans have returned beyond the glinting chop in slow gray rollers. Swans with arrogant necks gliding in procession under that same milky sky before the buds appeared when we walked on spongy turf through gorse and cattail down our secluded shore. Swans, luminous in glow, harvested from a frowning sky, sliding past our beach. Vanguard, arrayed serene in standing water, imperious as rooks upon a chessboard, their pageantry distilled from past parades. Only Lita learned to mourn a swan, you could not ache for such a beast. In attitude and style, each one a clone. Yet, at this time, after breakup, when they ride the frigid waters, sorrow sets me on edge, infected for a while with what I had known. Now this is a conversation with my father. My father was a military man. He'd seen far too much action. It's called making sense. Depends on where you are, he said. Depends on where you are. This chance, chance took with you in transit, your pass through, just how you do from dawn till dust. Depends on where you are, he said. Depends on where you are. He wasn't there. No longer here. He only was inside his head. The rest of him used up instead, rolling rocks up hills. That subtle mind, all work and war. Too close to read, too closed to care. Depends on where you are, he said. Depends on where you are. It's me now. For a little while. Hacking at my cycle's guile. Wincing at the bridges burned. Stunned by what I haven't learned. Depends on where you are, he'd say. Depends on where you are. He would smile that I should see how culture shapes our ancestry and misshapes now what we can be. Depends on where you are, I say. Depends on where you are. Now this, this last poem is a love poem. It's called Plenty. Strange, more than bread alone. It says for loss of myth, 
we must atone, or fear, or burn, or just give in and float through time forever. Well, that's plenty for today, I'd say. That's plenty for today. Strange. Such strange terrain to range riding on a question. Or seize up dumb. Done now. Down now. And downed forever. That's plenty for today. I believe that's too much for today. Strange. How we reason we can see. Yet, we resonate with mystery. Strange, how vibrations make sensations rise as thought. Voltaire's children set adrift on rafts of reason. I'd say, that's enough for today. Except, except your eyes. The message surfing down the line of sight through smiling eyes till I explode and hear your songs. That's plenty for today, my love. Loved plenty in each day. Thank you, Joe. That was wonderful. On to our uh, next feature, a very special man. Brandon Pitts almost needs no introduction in this audience. <laughs> well, welcome, Brandon. Oh. Woo! All the way from Seattle. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, so wonderful to have you here. Thank you all for coming. In a stone garden I have sat, waiting. I had visions of you as a child, a dark Madonna, sands the suckling babe. You would answer the calls each Wednesday, in the evening, their time. But then I came from the high country to the sea to teach them religion and you no longer had to suffer their ways. Now your body will be touched by one who is rightly guided, and you will know that love comes from some other place. For when that demon of self-destruction lies dormant asleep, then you will hear a whisper of your worth. Then I will call you Magdalene, and together we shall be. Um, I had a whole set planned out today and <laughs> timed it and everything and I'm like, oh, forget it, I'm just going to shoot from the hip. So, uh, yeah, I came up, uh, I came here from the United States and uh, I'm happy to be here because uh, a lot of crazy stuff is happening there right now and, and so being inspired by that. I'm going to dedicate this next poem to Donald Trump for I have seen the ghastly rider, the one who is marked by a swarm of hummingbirds as he pursed his lips. His caste is uncommon. He is the patron of criminals, men who steal lives and abandon care for cash. He dismounted and slowly walked through the streets that were aligned to the astral procession of the luminaries and stood before the great seal copper corrupted in green, though his strong arm bore a polished shield. And it was on that corner where I could see that my only option was to accept their number of weeks, a counter to track my movements as they pr provided for my every need. Spirits on the left of me, forces on the right, I looked to heaven where reality cracked, and the angelic host the chariot returned running, 
and those angels of a higher form kissed my lips, causing them to tingle as the Ophanim hath forsaken, circling the fallen buildings, and the Elohim issued their warning. There will come to you a man with one eye. He will show you water that you cannot drink and fire that will not burn. Warning to others, he travels fast, as fast as the speed of light, and can appear in many places at once and in as many forms, speaking all the languages, reversing the edict of Babel. He will survive the flood. Fire and brimstone shall not harm him, for he carries with him a number, an ISP tattooed on his chest. And I saw the shallow rider, marksman of the Holocaust, impervious to rain as he stood above us on the knoll, making his presence known. And the believers bowed to this man in worship. And in his hand, he carried a well-worn Bible marked with the iniquities of many generations. And the book was sealed with 12 locks. The rider broke the first four locks, releasing dust that smelled of sweet roses. He cracked the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth locks. Then came the smell of burnt sugar. Upon the breaking of the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth locks, I could smell the revolting stench of all the world's rot and feces. The writer opened the book. Within his pages, I paid witness to the horrors of many sleepless nights, wandering through foreign landscapes of concrete and asphalt, where the people spoke in whispers and hisses. O daughter of Irma, it is you who could save me, taking my hand and leading me to righteous lands. Do not leave me to the madness of these streets where I am tracked by their banks and marked with their ID and ISP number of weeks. O daughter of Irma, If you ever remember that you once loved me, you'll find me in the ocean, drowning, alone to the world, and peed on by the dogs of territory. But know this, I will die unmarked and free. Um, I'm reading today, mostly, I'll read one new poem, but I'm reading from my new book, Tender in the Age of Fury published by Mosaic Press, and uh, if you dig what I'm putting down, see me and I can get you a copy. This is called Ergot in the Rye. When the fog settles on the fields as the fourth wind slows, mice will scratch patterns on church floorboards. And the spirit that silences the birds of the tree will push the pig down deep into the sty on the day the neighbors can no longer plan their means to the cycles of the moon. But a man can lean on the Bible, smoking nightshade from a cob bowl to stand minister over the mandrake as Solomon had mastery over the gin until his children catch St. Anthony's fire, and mistbirths plague the pier, running widdershins with eyes glued to the steeple. And the good wife, buried in the yard, was burned for black charisma and blind incantations. Matthew approaches her headstone on the right, departs the stone on the left, taking with him that damp cold that puts infirm into one's bones. For frost will soon come to those of us who sustain our provender through the mercy of the field. This one uh, is, uh, was written under a copious amount of psychedelic mushrooms, about four grams or something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I woke up and read what I'd wrote, and I'm like, hey, cool. <laughs> you know, there's like slobber smears on the page and stuff. Um, yeah, it's called Chaldeans. We are the spore stars, watching the planets, charting the horizons, finding patterns in all things. We are the Chaldeans, underwriters of the heavenly war, debating on the number string, mapping out the luminous orbs. Soma constitutes the greater part of our geometry. We anoint with semen as the spermatozoa swims in an array, fanning out like tendrils, veins in the Gothic arch. We are the apostles of the eternal glory, winners on the astroplane, laying on our backs in bliss, accepting the throb and thrust within the plasmatic ocean of the never-ending womb. 
for the void is pleasant, and love is the best thing in any world, and we are eternity and insemination holding all the answers. We are the Brahmins, princes of the cosmic waste, that primordial gland that issues chaos throughout creation while expanding the universe through pulse and penetration. Oh, great potential, showing us glimpses of your splendor. We are the righteous tribesmen seeking out the menstrual cycle of the lunar houses. For creation is our highest act, as we reap from the broken veil in that place where there is no time. We are the harvesters of wisdom, marked by apostolic succession, phosphor and Christian halos and Phrygian caps, the Aryan council in the darkened night where neon mandalas glow in the fray. We are the sailors on the event horizon, with our third eye tethered to the sacred gem, the zephyr of nothingness, the priestly elect above judgment and the laws of average men, with our days spent in stasis, swimming in the ocean of God. I'm going to read my newest poem, and uh, just because it's timely, unfortunately, and uh, it's called "After Going to Bed Homeless and Sad." Hope after going to bed hopeless and sad, only to wake and find that 49 people had been shot dead in Orlando while I slept. We stand with love, abound and one with universe, listening to the life sound of things and the inherent energy of stone. We hear the cry of birth, the fear of passing, friends whose mortal stem was short. We weep for those who wanted peace and sought joy but expired into panic. We weep for mothers whose love was severed, a connection reduced to memory. We weep for the killer whose last moments were spent in hate, to pass in confusion lost in the eddies of pain. We weep for the hate that left the gun and spread to the people, teaching children division. We weep for the leaders who used the hate to further their gains and extend control. We weep for the flock who follows the ill-gotten shepherd, turning the red letters to black. There is no hate only an absence of love. There is no race or creed, only the need to exist. There is no death, only dying. There is no Jesus, only the task to forgive. There is no Muhammad, only a past moment in a thing called time. There is no revenge, only an open heart that bleeds. So stand with love. It is the only path to be free. A request from our host, one more. Yes, Renaissance woman, Brenda Clues, thank you. (laughs) Marvelous reading series, really happy to be here. And uh, okay, this next poem, uh, I use a slang word called drubby. And you can look this up. Uh, Urban Slang Dictionary says it's the feeling a man gets down there after the expulsion of seed, so... Beware of the drubby that wanders the cornfields at night, steals the souls of sleepers and drives them back to a time where men ate raw meat and gnawed on dirt-covered roots, tore at women with a brute fang, proof of a love that a man can feel. Hey, Jim, why'd you do that evil deal? Out in the woods where only the frogs heard poor Delilah cry. Hey, Jim, can you tell me why? For that devil takes you, casts you back up on the wheel, where Legba presides over the cycle of reason to purge your ordeal. In the lesson of transformations, where I sat on the wet nurse's lap, she sang songs about the old times in that far-off land, where cracked hands beat spells upon drums, and how to sell your soul to the drubby out on Highway 61. When he taps you on the shoulder, take the deal, don't look back, and the grimoire will reveal its secrets, even to those who can't understand. But it was dropping hail when I came to the crossroads of my life, down in Beauregard, Mississippi, out on Route 49. So I gwan through the thistle patch, a contract in my hand, drew a circle in the cornfield where they go and see the drubby man. Hey, Jim, why you lay down your plow? Hey, Jim, you left your woman to fend for the sow. Jimbo, 
You're gone to revel in the city swell, but stop steal peaches and asleep in the hay. They'll find you, Jimbo. Find you one day. But tonight, you'll hop a freight train and dream of new lands where money and women come to a man with a strength of dreams and a mind to foretell. But there'll be no more wishes from the drubby's secret well. And this was the prophecy that the angel foretold. A mannish boy would be born on the eve Delilah went cold. Wow, that was terrific. We've all missed Brandon, haven't we? <laughs> uh, so now we're going to have our final feature, William Bouvet. Bouvet? Bouvet. And uh, he is a classically trained uh, guitarist who is also internationally known and loved. Welcome, William. So is this is mostly from your new CD? It's from the new CD, which is called Old Wood, New Seeds. This is the old wood, and my brain provides the new seeds. It's the opening four tracks, which is called Appalachian Colors. Oh, Appalachian Gold, Appalachian Red, followed by Appalachian Green, Appalachian Blue. There will be uh, interludes between some of them, depending on my mood.
That was beautiful. Thank you, William. I could listen to him forever. <laughs> A master guitarist. Uh, William and Ariel did a CD at one point of uh, Unspoken, Dreams. Unspoken Dreams of Rumi's Poetry. So uh, that's online. You can get it on iTunes and yeah. And you can also buy uh, his CDs on online iTunes and Google Play or whatever all the, yeah. Um, I know what I'm going to be doing. <laughs> I have his first CD, but, or the earlier one. Yeah. So uh, what a wonderful evening. Thank you all so much for coming out. You're all beautiful and wonderful and adorable and talented. And I'm so happy. <laughs> and um, I'd like to thank all our features, Ariel, Joe, Brandon, and William, and uh, our open mic. Yeah, they were wonderful. Thank you. And our open mic, Joni and Stanley and Jennifer. Have a wonderful evening. Stay cool. <laughs> Thank you.